that uh, so Neo4j, for example, uh, is used to store a version of triples called property graphs. And um, uh, for many years, um, you know, uh, the big companies, the companies with big amount of data, uh, refuse to adopt the semantic web uh, uh, approach uh, because the uh, cost of storing and querying in RDF was very high. When you uh, store this representation into uh, you know, a database form, you do what is called as reification, flatten it out. And um, uh, that will take a lot of space because you know and and uh, and very large space when you query also takes very small time so i remember uh, even my own company when i and I, I i i was well aware of rdf i had used it before in my research but even for uh, our own company we did not use rdf database we use a form of this uh, property graph uh, version of the storage for knowledge uh meant for you know knowledge as described in a knowledge graph so, um, so in anyway, uh, since we are recording, I'm just going to repeat the question. That the question is about knowledge graph is storage. Um, did I answer your question? Yes, you did. And then um, I did have another quick question. How far out do you think we are from um, understand or utilizing? Uh, semantic knowledge to understand that certain things are sarcasm <laughs> okay so uh, okay before i answer this question uh, i forgot to add that when you uh, earlier your question was about uh, uh, temporality in the data and the data that changes or knowledge that changes so this triple form that i mentioned subject particular object is by itself not adequate enough to capture the time or any metadata Time is a metadata that this fact is valid at this particular point of time. And, uh, and then another, uh, you know, uh, think about the first lady example I gave you is uh, valid at some other point of time. So for that, there are, uh, so this is a property on the triple. And one way to capture it, there are possible, you know, many possible ways to capture it. One way is to, instead of triple, make it a quad add one more property or attribute, and then you add the time, right? So now you have the ability to capture uh, the time, and then you can using, use the query language that supports the time to understand the evolution of the knowledge. Now, you're coming, uh, now you ask the question about um, um, uh, understanding some challenging aspects such as sarcasm. Now, this question doesn't have anything directly to deal with the standard semantic issues and semantic web. This has more to deal with language processing and language understanding. So at least in the computer science parlance, this comes you know, in NLP or NLU space. The two are related in that uh, in the next class, where you know, we are going to discuss how knowledge improves machine learning to do things just like that. So, in fact, one of the examples we will discuss in the next class, and I already posted um, the presentation uh, on that, and a video is there that talks about emoji understanding. So, you understand, so you have a lot of such questions about language. You have a question about um, um, uh, sentiment understanding, emotion understanding, uh, sarcasm understanding, which you asked. Um, another very important understanding is um, uh, uh, the understanding of uh, Vishal. What were you trying to do? Humor prediction. Human understanding or prediction, so that this text has human uh, humor in that. Humor, you look at it or sarcasm, they are very complicated, and they are contextual in nature. And uh, you know, so. Um, um, Understanding that uh, this is a sarcasm uh, may require you, for example, a cultural context, may involve you historical context, you know, you to know that. I mean, so none of these, these are very, very hard problems. Of the two, I would say, because having worked on those two, 
uh, and many others. I would say that uh, uh, humor detection is even harder than sarcasm detection. We really try to do humor detection. Uh, uh, one of the uh, projects that uh, we are working on is on uh, the um, um, uh, prevalence or occurrence of mental health and addiction and, and gender violence because during the time of this COVID-19. So if you are reading news, you will see that during the COVID-19, there is a striking or significant in increase in um, you know, mental health uh, problems that people face. The isolation for uh, young people, not being able to meet with your friends and your activities, uh, you know, uh, significantly, um, uh, you know, limiting you. Or for young couples or people who are working with small family, losing a job, let's say, how am I, how am I, how am I going to pay my bills? You know, so those kind of things, all of these have led to um, mental health, anxiety, stress, all those kind of things. It has also led to addiction. Uh, people are um, abusing opioids, people are, uh, you know, there's painkiller abuse, many things that happen, right? Uh, it's an area that we have researched, uh, funded by National Institute of Health. Um, so, um, we are talking about this and presenting this research to um, some journalists. Uh, there are a couple of news stories about our work uh, you can find on our COVID-19 page. Um, so, um, one of the uh, uh, journalists was working on humor, use of humor during COVID-19. And they asked us to address this question. Uh, we looked at it and we really could not solve that problem well at all. Uh, but, but, but these are, now what, what happens here is though, these are not, while this is not a directly knowledge related problem, knowledge graph problem, there is a role of knowledge. So one specific example is, um, uh, the, the, the use of language, uh, and that is recorded in, let's say, a structured form. There's one particular resource called Urban Dictionary. So, you know, Google for Urban Dictionary, if you're interested, basically Urban Dictionary tells you how a particular uh, term, phrase uh, is used, um, uh, what, what is their of the self meaning. Yeah? We say that person is cool. But that's, you know, uh, cool as in not temperature, but cool in, you know, uh, in behavior. So, um, but even the same term would have very different interpretation in US versus France, for example. So if I want to understand, let's say when we get to, uh, you know, let's say analyzing tweets, sometimes we have to know where the tweet is from and then apply geographic, uh, geographical the relevant meaning that may come from a source like um, um, Urban Dictionary, right? So it's very, um, you know, interesting thing. Uh, the, the things that I will discuss with, you know, to uh, next class, uh, and which, as you, uh, uh, as you know, I have shared with you yesterday, um, will tell you, will discuss specific use cases uh, of how the traditional text processing or machine learning uh, is improved upon by use of knowledge. So the title of my talk uh, and, and the presentation is knowledge will uh, um, propel machine understanding of content, right? Uh, the, what, what happened is that um, uh, in the first decade of this century, I mean, around the, you know, you're talking about something like 2001, uh, two, three, all the way to uh, 2010 to 12. Um, uh, the AI area of machine learning, the traditional machine learning, what you might call, you know, your SVM model or uh, uh, random forest model or all of those things, right? Uh, they became very popular. So people would, you know, create training set and train the models, the multi train multiple models, figure out which was works the best by evaluation and then deploy that. That became very popular. But um, uh, the, the idea is that the, that model essentially exploits statistics. 
Um, and there, there was um, a very popular uh, or very highly uh, noticed paper from Google uh, on what is called as unreasonable effect effectiveness of big data. Unreasonable effectiveness of big data. The thesis was that um, if you give me a lot of data about any subject matter, I can basically solve your problems you have about you know, exploiting the data. Right? And um, so uh, some people like me uh, objected and were just did not believe in that uh, and did not agree with that because I had also done the companies and I worked on a lot of problems and I had seen firsthand that uh, machine learning is useful, but not uh, you know necessary in many problems, but not sufficient. Right. So I uh, you know uh, proposed. Um, uh, I discussed uh, use of knowledge um, in all these contexts uh, of, you know, in addition to machine learning. And one of the, you know, kind of uh, abstract of that is this uh, knowledge uh, 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 proper machine understanding of content. And we look at a lot of uh, uh, problems that we had done in our own research. It shows that, look, we can solve the problem to this level using machine learning, but to solve it better, you really need knowledge, and uh, that pro that that general theme has uh, continued to uh, um, repeat in our body of work, my body of work of uh, my team, my, my you know my, my center and institute. The um, and it has taken many different forms of it, but I've been basically driven by um, uh, generally what you might call as uh, the idea of brain-inspired computing. And um, uh, not the next class, but the one after that, we'll be talking about semantic cognitive and perceptual computing. And there I will talk about broader vision of computing, but that computing vision comes from uh, some very uh, influential work um, in uh, not just computer science, but beyond computer science. So in cognitive science, uh, uh, the psychologists, talk about top brain and bottom brain and how both of them work together to uh, really solve a problem. Now, the machine learning is roughly the uh, counterpart of the ideas that psychologists talk about in bottom brain. And we also call that perception. Uh, the, it is also called uh, system one thinking. So Daniel Kahneman, is a two, uh, Nobel Prize winning economist. And he has written this book, uh, System One and System Two. Uh, so thinking slow and thinking thinking fast. Thinking fast is, uh, is what we, you know, our, uh, our, uh, is the thinking that happens immediately on the spot in milliseconds. For example, you visually see something that happens without uh, you know, you are kind of um, consciously thinking about it. Suppose you are play, playing a baseball or cricket and the ball comes at you and it's about to hit you, you're going to move yourself. There's no conscious thinking happening there, right? It's called perception. Right? And this is thinking fast. But thinking fast is also very error prone and limited in certain contexts. So the counterpart of thinking fast is thinking slow. This is deliberate uh, you know, thinking. Some of your brains are working. I still have to work on that uh, assignment of that uh, you know, other class. That's thinking slow. You're deliberately planning what you're going to do. All right. So um, uh, the point here is that I've been uh, quite influenced by work in neuroscience in behavioral economics, which is the system one, system two, in psychology, this is uh, top brain, bottom brain. And I have seen how you can make um, computational system more intelligent, more powerful. And that has led to basically a combining machine learning with knowledge and deep learning with knowledge. So one of the uh, uh, top area of um, uh, research at the AI Institute here uh, in which we also, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, 
E is what is called as knowledge infused learning. So it is knowledge infused natural language processing, knowledge infused deep learning, right? And um, I just posted in the AI Institute uh, web uh, page on the LinkedIn a video of a tutorial that we did on uh, knowledge infused learning. Uh, at an international conference. So if you're interested and ambitious, go and look at that. All of you, you know, should have, you know, have, have, have looked at and should be following if you're interested in what we do in this class, follow our um, uh, LinkedIn page uh, that, uh, you know, that talks about some of the main things coming out of the Institute. So um, uh, anyway, um, I think uh, I went into a lot of diversions, but I'm kind of piecing together a lot of things. Any other question? Okay, in that case, I'm going to uh, share, uh, you know, go to the uh, presentation that you are supposed to be, uh, 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 yeah, thanks Christopher Lee for your uh, link. Uh, oh, so that's for uh, either Christopher link or um, Jonathan Sharp also has, link. okay, yeah, Christopher Lee link, thank you. All right, now uh, let's, uh, let me share the screen. Uh, and, uh, da, da, da. Ah. All right, so this is the um, presentation I had asked you to look at. Um, I, uh, you know, I mean, do, doing the whole presentation here will be too long and we don't have enough time in the class. The whole idea is that I, uh, you know, I want you to um, ask the questions. So I'm going to go through very fast to just, oh, this basically when we started the AI Institute, uh, what were the key things, you know, in our uh, mind, uh, what, what, what would be the emphasis of the AI Institute and uh, just some of the projects that we do in, with many, many different, in many, many different areas. Um, and then here I have, uh, you know, uh, definition of knowledge graph and something related called knowledge um, uh, network. Now here I, I mentioned uh, different representations um uh you know that people have used over the you know for knowledge uh, and they have come from uh, many different disciplines of computer science and logic and uh, and, and and others but here you can see in the middle this rdf uh, on the left of the left side uh, the it's a weaker representation on the right hand side it is a more what you might call stronger representation but a stronger representation comes at additional cost of creation, maintenance, storage, and many other things. So there are pros and cons. And which one, uh, you know, is the right one for you, always it depends. Uh, there are different forms of knowledge being pursued here, facts and assertions, taxonomy, schema instances, logic and multi-class, description logic, first of all logic, graphs, uh, where relationships are playing a big role, probabilistic graph, and more. This is very high level view. This this picture was made in year, I think 2002 probably. It just kind of visually shows you um, uh, in a, a kind of a view of knowledge graph. This is about knowledge graph about a company and the company's tech products and company's industry and regulation and everything that goes about, you know, running a company. This is a knowledge graph about, um, you know, drug uh, you know, pharmaceutical drugs. Here is a uh, knowledge, multimodal knowledge graph where you have uh, not only this textual item, but also picture. Picture is also part of the knowledge graph. Um, uh, here, uh, uh, we have developed tools to visualize knowledge graph in 3D, three dimensions. And um, here, this is a very complex, uh, on, uh, 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 I would say, ontology uh, for representation of complex carbohydrate molecules. And how can you form valid um, sugar molecules? Uh, these are complex glycan structures. Uh, here it talks about uh, knowledge graph, uh, so sources of knowledge graph, so something called linked data, 
So this is old data, but it has more than 10,000 data sets. Some of the data set may have a billion triples or more. We had deposited one data set there, which had 2 billion triples. Uh, and then there's DBPDA extracted from, uh, uh, there's DBPDA is just one of them from which you, uh, you know, from Wikipedia rather, you know, uh, Wikipedia uh, uh, is extracted into DBPDA, which is uh, one node in this, uh, in this linked open data. And this is, there is a Google knowledge graph. This is, these are old data. I, I, you know, uh, there is, um, you know, uh, schema.org annotations and many other things. And then this shows you uh, some process of extracting from linked open data to create knowledge graph for, let's say, books or movies. Uh, here, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, okay, I'll just pass that. Uh, this shows you, um, uh, that uh, sometimes uh, uh, you have you may have a knowledge graph, but then you analyze text to create uh, additional to find additional facts or find the replacement facts, uh, uh, replicate old data uh, knowledge and uh, put in the new one uh, by mining text. So this is an example where uh, we are mining uh, electronic medical records to find new medical related knowledge. Uh, and there is this um, uh, relatively influential paper that we wrote about semantics um, <clears throat> as used in machine learning, as used in uh, reasoning, and as used in uh, soft uh, logic. Uh, uh, you know, uh, so uh, okay. And there are many ways. So this this say, tells you about um, uh, knowledge graph uh, that uh, various companies are using. Uh, there's a very nice article on that I cited below. Um, and then there are a lot of use of knowledge graph. This we have discussed before. So it's a reputation. This shows you how the knowledge graphs uh, that we had used in the company were created. Uh, we have already discussed that, so I'm going to bypass these issues. This is an application, interesting application where, um, for example, in electronic medical record that doctor is using, if the doctor prescribes new medication, the system will automatically check uh, whether there is any side effect or the drug to drug interaction as an example. A lot of other sophisticated things that this application had. Um, and uh, it's actually still ongoing, uh, functional. Um, this is something we have talked about already. Um, now, uh, you know, we talked about this info box that Google has and the similar thing that uh, my company did. Uh, but the other thing is that you can uh, combine a uh, search and browsing. So you can search, get some data in that you all the uh, entities are annotated. Then you look for more and you browse to some other uh, documents that they talk about that. So that this is the diagram that shows about search and browsing working together. I, I call it blended semantic browsing and querying. Uh, here is a exploration of content and no, using knowledge in three dimensional to study the terrorism in Middle East. Um, and then uh, this is what we're going to talk about in the next class. Uh, we had talked about this before. Okay, I will try to explain, try to see what is really uh, new that we have not done. So, um, under if you there's a very very um, there's an important term machine intelligence, and um, you know Google defined it as all aspects of machine learning. Um, I disagreed, and many others would disagree also, and really. 
are you implying human level of intelligence are you going to define uh, intelligence that machine has as inherently limited uh, as limited as machine learning is or are you going to say intelligence that machine has and we want to take uh, 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 machine intelligence as close to human intelligence as possible there are some things that machines can to do today that uh, surpasses human's ability to do that same thing going through large amount of data and finding some patterns machine can do far better and fast faster than humans can even uh, such thing as uh, identification of let's say potentially uh, <coughs> cancerous uh, tumor in a radiology uh, 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 you know, image that kind of things machine can do much better today in image processing but human intelligence is far more encompassing than the intelligence that um, uh, you know uh, that, that comes with uh, machine learning and that is the uh, topic that we wanted to um, uh, talk about let's see I'm going to discuss many of these things in the next class. Um, I want to see if there is anything interesting that I want to go through today. Okay, so um, I, I, I talked to you, with you guys the concept of this bottom top down symbolic approach um, and uh, bottom up uh, statistical approach. And um, there are some interesting things about deep learning that it is far, uh, thus far, is very data hungry. Uh, I recently had to um, uh, give a talk on sustainability and AI and I you know came across some graphs that showed that uh, just to train one uh, language model uh, especially something like GPT-2 and GPT-3 um, it takes so much power uh, uh, it takes uh, far more power than humans uh, uh, energy humans spend in the whole lifetime and many humans spend in their lifetimes so this is a big issue uh, in, in, in um, the interesting thing is um, uh, the uh, human brain, the energy consumption in human brain is so much more efficient compared to um, um, uh, energy, uh, uh, you know, um, use of energy in, in our digital systems, right? So it's very, um, uh, interesting and, and there are a lot of interesting questions to ask you know especially uh, for neuroscience um, or questions to ask of neuroscience uh, as to what makes the human brain so so energy efficient compared to it doesn't get it doesn't heat up compared to the data centers that heat up uh, with the uh, so much use of uh, energy um, and uh, for example uh, here's a very interesting thing um, Deep learning thus far has no natural way to deal with hierarchical structure. And yet, um, just um, uh, today I shared uh, with the students um, uh, this uh, keynote that Hinton gave in the same place we gave our tutorial, um, where he talks about capturing part whole, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, representation, a partonomy, part relationship, part, part whole concept representation. Um, and that is very interesting and, and I do need to look deeply into that because uh, maybe uh, with that uh, you can get to these other knowledge representations, right, hierarchy and, and such. Um, and then a few, uh, uh, I, I'm sure you guys have uh, read this now, I rely on you guys to ask me a question uh, so that I can go deeper into this uh, point. And then, uh, you know, this knowledge infused learning, uh, which is a uh, major area of uh, work that we will be discussing a little bit later on. So uh, to some extent, um, 
this talk that we had today or, or that, that I wanted you to uh, uh, look at um, is more a preview to some of the things that we are going to talk in more detail as we go along. And now here I'm talking about, um, uh, you know, uh, variety of applications and how the knowledge graph. Uh, so when we will discuss this deeply and I'll, I'll give you the paper to read, uh, it shows on the uh, you know, left hand side, um, uh, this is the error rate that is uh, plotted here. And when you use lexical and syntactic feature versus when you add more features and more features, and then you up, uh, add knowledge graph uh, based on DSM-5. So there's DSM-5 knowledge, then you add additional knowledge called drug abuse ontology, and then you add additional knowledge in terms of slang term and terms, and that keeps on bringing it. So basically, uh, the first three, uh, you know, points uh, in this graph, the left, left half of the graph, um, are the solutions that are not practically usable because th there's too much error. And then once you go, the error rate, you know, in three percent and less than three percent, that becomes uh, much more uh, at the level of human performance or even better. Uh, okay, uh, we'll, we'll be discussing some of these things a bit later, and I would like you to read more about them. before we discuss them. Uh, here we are uh, going to talk about um, use of knowledge graph in the left hand side to address one of the most challenging problem uh, for autonom uh, autonomous vehicles. So where one of the most important problem uh, for autonomous vehicle is to identify complete uh, scene similarity. Am I looking at something that I have looked, uh, uh, that I have seen before at some point? So suppose you are driving through a school zone, something you have looked at it, and something you have your knowledge that you know the, the school uh, zone means uh, you have to be careful, and the child may you know uh, run to the road any time. So this kind of knowledge humans have, machines don't have that. How do you give them that kind of knowledge, and how can you use knowledge so that they can more efficiently understand? Oh, you know what? This is similar to that school. Um, you know, zone that I've been through, and in the school zone, there is this, this this regulation apply that you cannot drive faster than 20 miles per hour or 25 miles per hour. All right, so I, in fact, tied to computing for human experience, uh, experience also. And uh, so, you know, what, what, what is happening in AI today is um, uh, there is a big uh, um, emphasis in um, uh, being able to explain how a, uh, an AI system, how a deep learning algorithm came up with um, a particular prediction or particular suggestion or particular uh, result outcome. And um, what, what for, you know, it, from 2012, when deep learning became um, very uh, started to become popular, to until recently, like 2018 or so, uh, people kept on, you know, improving the deep learning, and they have some fantastic results. But then people started to become uncomfortable uh, in that these uh, these uh, techniques are, are were seen as what is called as what is called black box. So you can't explain how they came to results. Because of that, a lot of uh, people would not want to use it. For example, even if the uh, AI uh, technique is better than doctors, doctors won't use it because it cannot explain how it came with that um, uh, result. And if you cannot explain, then uh, you are liable to lawsuit and many other problems. Uh, and other problems. So um, uh, you need to be able to explain and. Uh, here uh, we're talking about a variety of applications uh, for you guys. We basically work on all of these topics in our um, institute and the faculty in our institute. Um, and um, anyway, um, there is this uh, very interesting paper. So here is what I will also give you as a homework to do. Uh, I, I want you to read this paper by um, uh, Pedro Dominguez. Uh, he's a very well-known uh, machine learning um, uh, researcher. 
And uh, Pedro uh, in this paper has given very good review of uh, machine learning. And one of the things that stand, stood out for me is that he talked about this data alone is not enough. And, uh, and that's something that uh, we have always liked, that message we always liked and worked on that for quite some time. Okay, anyway, um, so this is the um, uh, uh, kind of a quick uh, review of uh, what uh, I, you know, this presentation. Let's look at what are the other things I'd ask, I ask you to look at. So uh, I think that's the present, uh, what, is, what is this here? Okay, so that, sorry, is the uh, talk itself. Could I, yeah. could I ask about um, infusing knowledge into LSTMs? It's the slide 11, uh, 100 and uh, 101. Can you go into a little bit more detail on those and what the uses would be for that? And because I'm using LSTMs now and I don't, I don't think we're using a knowledge graph and I wondered if it would improve results on some of the research. Um, let, so let sli me... slide, slide 100 and 101, if you wanna, yeah. So, um, the, 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 when you, uh, when you have you, in this LSTM cells, when you have, um, latent representations, uh, what happens is that, uh, here you consult the knowledge and uh, improve upon the differentiation that you would have. Uh, and so you com compute what we call as differential knowledge. Uh, and with that, you can um, um, come up with a better, uh, you know, um, optimization of what you are going to do. So let me, uh, is Manas there? Do, we, do you remember what application did we're doing here? Um, I, I'm using um, uh, dual LSTMs to uh, um, to translate. It's basically NLP to translate, say, from English to uh, Chinese, um, basically, and then we're applying that to something else. But uh, so we're using uh, LSTMs I, in I, pair. I, I was just asking one of my students uh, to help me remind. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Which application we applied this to? That one, let, huh? let, let me do the, the following. I will post um, uh, uh, later today uh, the particular paper that uh, actually uh, discusses this particular thing in detail. Uh, Manas, you are there, right? Yes. Manas, where did you use this? So this was actually used when, uh, for example, uh, uh, I don't remember who uh, raised this question, uh, but uh, who has, whoever is relevant. Um, so the idea was that when you are training your model and I, it has a, like a sequence of chains of LSTM cells, there's a possibility that the end of the LSTM cells uh, might generate a completely varied representation to what it was given as an input. So the idea was that you reinforce the input, the information by adding some external knowledge at the end 
so that it it gets uh, so, so that the con the context of the input is preserved when you are giving the output now in this uh, lstm cells there are many versions of it uh, for example this re uh, representation is called single input and single output but there are uh, single input and multiple output lstm cells as well but uh, the idea but it all depends upon the applications as such since you are talking about translation uh, if i'm not if i'm not mistaken which is english, let's say english to spanish translation that you're doing your lstm cells will be more or less of single input and multiple output and not single input and single output so in that case i would say uh, for that application i don't think so you really require a knowledge specific you only require a training set a training data set where you have english and spanish translation because that's not actually very specific to a loss of information that would actually affect uh, someone at the end but when we are talking about some complex sentences in social media or in web forums where things are where the sentences are ambiguous they are long and uh, it and the lstm cells or se sequential models are more vulnerable to lose the context by the end of the output layer we want to develop methods that would actually reinforce them now there are other methods like for example like highway connections or skip connections where you reiterate your input but that's again just saying that uh, if there is an input error in the input the same error will be propagated in the output so we want that extra knowledge will actually not only help us in reinforcing the output information but also it will many uh, maintain that the information that is given output at the output is explainable and the system is as a whole is interpretable and the the information can be checked whether the outcome is meaningful or it is something that is erroneous manas have you seen a uh, work where um, given that uh, lstms are working on the close uh, you know uh, sequential text uh, that there is still a value of um, uh, kind of global or uh, you know broader thing for example there may be slang yes uh, and uh, or synonyms yeah, yeah. Uh, like out of word uh, stuff as well, is yeah. it, like out of vocabulary things. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 uh, I mean, if I wanted to, let's say, um, bring in uh, uh, the weights that uh, reflect not just the use of this uh, term, but all its alternatives, mm -hmm. how would you, how would I do that? So, this is where we may try to essentially bring in the knowledge saying, I've seen this term. It uh, it is a different syntax, but the same meaning. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That that's that's where you need knowledge. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, not actually. I would not say that in translation you need knowledge because you know what specific terms needs to be come at the output. So well, you are pretty much aware of. Translation has the advantage of typically very large amount of corpus. And, yeah. Uh, and and translation is uh, another a, a, a good example of something where. You do not need to understand the language. Yes, yeah, you know, that's a fundamental thing. So what happens is that I mean, if a translation uses this word, there's mm -hmm. no reason that the uh, system needs to understand an alternative term that you could have used. Yeah, you just need that translation to be right, and hence um, there is very little role or no role practically of um, uh, that's a, that's one good example of a very heavily statistical process. Yes. Uh, uh, the um, at a very I'm talking about a very high level uh, uh, that between when you go from NLP to NLU natural language understanding uh, like how humans interpret uh, the terms for example how human may how these terms may uh, or phrase may invoke human emotions simply attention based thing then yeah then you would have a lot more value of the knowledge. Yeah, I guess that's where I'm at. Actually, we're trying to get more into the semantic meanings rather than just word to word. So yeah, but yeah, that's not that, that's not required for translation, right? Well, it's not. It's not. <laughs> we're just starting with translation. We're we're putting it to some other tasks as well. Uh, I would just want to add to this: if you are focusing on the semantic understanding while you're doing a translation. All right. Uh, I think that is a, entirely a different territory of machine translation. So when I when you say machine translation, it's always from one to one. Like you have a sentence and you have another sentence in another language. 
but what if like if you are saying semantic understanding that's comes to an abstractive level of understanding the text yeah right that's a different story because that's not simply a machine translation so you are saying that i want to comprehend the text and want to paraphrase it and give a paraphrase response so that's a different thing yeah that 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 would be a very different thing uh, or yeah. or or you might want to actually create uh, let's say uh, culturally uh, um, uh, sensitive aspects so suppose you say that uh, the, you know any language has a kind of a low language and high language you know language used by um, people on the street and language used by let's say highly educated people right and now you say okay uh, here is an input uh, the input is uh, from literature it needs to be translated into another equivalent literature level of uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, this uh, terms uh, you know language then um, uh, and, and let's say oh i got um, uh, street language but i want a, an equivalent of that in the other language of uh, highbrow uh, you know usage then uh, in those kind of contexts you have to steer uh, the things you you have uh, for example external knowledge saying uh, or external statistics from corpus saying that uh, uh, these are the preferred terms for these concepts. But the fact that there's the same concept, but there are different terms to describe them, that typically need, would need to be represented in a structure, structured knowledge, and hence you could use knowledge graph. Okay. Um, what else? Guys, now um, uh, on the fifth of March, I'm going to arrange a, um, uh, a lecture by uh, a professor at George Mason University. Um, I wanted to get sense: would would people like a, a broad conceptual lecture, or they want to uh, kind of look at detailed description of a paper? Are there preferences? Do you guys want to share with me whether you're enjoying, you know, broad conceptual discussions and um, a lot of things, uh, a lot of insights and alternative, or you want to, you know, now say, oh, do a kind of here's one paper and go through all the details and technical details as if, as if you're writing a paper. I would like a specific paper discussion. Okay. Are there? Um... I don't know. I think there's benefits to both. <laughs> Either way, yeah. Yeah, I've been uh, enjoying the broader perspective, um, but it would be nice sometimes to have a narrow range, like a specific paper. Yeah. So that can be very much done. The only issue would be be prepared that um, uh, not everybody will be interested in all the details of. Um, that goes into an individual paper discussion. On the other hand, that is, uh, it's a good idea. If you are, if you're not naturally um, getting a lot of experience in reading papers, then that is a good idea. In our, in our AI Institute, we have uh, three meetings, um, and uh, or at least we have, at least we have one meeting that discusses paper, and one meeting that um, you know presents uh, that discusses presentations, that gives presentations uh, and reviews the research progress. So, so students can uh, sample both of them. But uh, then obviously um, only a small section of people are interested in one narrow area. Well, uh, I, only two people have, uh, uh, you know, spoken up. Uh, I'll, I'll take, make my choice unless I, you know, go ahead and write, uh, uh, you know, in your comment. What would you like to a you know today's post for example post for today's lecture? Go ahead and write in the comment. I like a broader uh, overview, or I would like a single paper discussed in detail. Is there a way to make a poll? I think there should be a way to way to make a poll. I'll I'll, I'll figure that out. 
All right. Uh, so I think that uh, brings us to the closure of today's um, uh, lecture. But uh, let's see what we can do. Uh, let's quickly review uh, what do we have uh, on on the store. So for the uh, next um, class. We are going to let me stop.